book it. But know that we need to respond. Know that we need to share. And know the importance of it. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. The topic that we're going to talk about is one that's very important. One that is very important. And like I said, I, I, I think that it's a good way to remind us. You know, we did communion this morning um, because it is a reminder. Jesus said that we are to do it often. Why? Because he knew we would forget, right? It reminds us of his love. It reminds us of his, of his sacrifice. It reminds us of the forgiveness that he offers and the price that he paid that we could have our salvation. And just like communion reminds us of that, it's, it's this text this morning that reminds us of the basic message and the basic mission of the church, the basic quest of the Christian, which is that we are to go forth preaching the gospel, telling people how they may be saved. And can I tell you this morning, church, salvation in a lot of our churches, specifically I would say in a lot of Methodist churches today, is not preached the way it should be or is not preached enough. In fact, in a lot of times in our culture today and in many uh, more progressive churches, we find that salvation in Jesus Christ alone is a very controversial topic because of the pluralistic society in which we now live. Where to say that Jesus Christ is the only way and the only truth and the only life is a statement that is controversial. Because how dare we say that we have the truth and nobody else. But can I tell you, folks, I don't have to say that we have the truth and, anything else, or, and, and nobody else does. This book from God tells me that we have the truth and nobody else does. And it's that truth that we are supposed to share because it is for everyone. And the text that we have this morning, it provides a blueprint of what it looks like for someone to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone to become saved. Someone to follow Jesus and how to proclaim it and what to say, which I think is something that we all get tripped up on sometimes, right? We, okay, we know we're supposed to share the gospel. We know we're supposed to be proclaiming Jesus, but what do we do when the situation presents itself? Uh, what do we say? How do we react? I think those things can all be found in here. And so while we look at the text, let me give you a little background. Paul and his brothers, Paul and Silas, are in jail. They've been put in jail because they were preaching the gospel. They were put in jail that while they were preaching the gospel, they actually loosed a demonic girl who was being used to bring money to some men. And these men were so upset that this girl was loosed from her demonic possession and that they could not make money off of her anymore. These men complained and Paul and Silas, because of it, were thrown into jail. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Silas were put into jail in the first century for sharing the gospel and for someone to be saved and loosened from demonic possession. Can I tell you, we are not that far away from a situation like that returning in our world today. The gospel is a message of power. The gospel is a message of freedom. The gospel is a message that will turn someone's life around. And listen to me, when people who take advantage of other people in their demonic strongholds lose that power because of the gospel, those agents of darkness will come after you and try to shut you down. We're seeing it already. Just north to us in Canada, they're getting ready to pass a law. That by preaching against human sexuality as the culture knows it, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's transgenderism, to expound a biblical viewpoint on that will soon be punishable by law as a hate crime. Folks, it's coming. If it's just north of the border, it ain't too far from the United States. We're seeing it. People don't like biblical truth that sets people free, and the enemy will work to not destroy it, but to shut it up. Paul and Silas are in jail. And in their jail, look at what it says in verse 25. I love it. It says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. 
They weren't down on their luck. Amen. <laughs> they weren't discouraged. Amen. <laughs> Come on now, we think that we get thrown in jail for doing the work of God. Some of us would start throwing a pity party and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not Paul and that's not Silas. May we have the spirit of Paul and the spirit of Silas. Oh wait, if you know Jesus Christ, you got the same spirit of Paul and the same spirit of Silas. It's the Holy Spirit and it says that in jail, in their hour of need, they prayed. It says they prayed. And not only did they pray, what's it say in verse 25? It says they sang praises unto God. They had a little mini worship service going on in the prison. (laughs) They may have said, we're going to keep you from trying to spread the gospel outside of the walls of the prison. But praise God, they couldn't stop them from sharing the gospel on the inside of the prison. It didn't matter where they were. They had prayer in their mouth. They had praise in their heart. And they lifted it up and they sang. And I love the last part of verse 25. Look at what it says. It says, and the prisoners heard them. Oh, come on now. Can I tell you, the world is not only watching when you as a Christian go through hardships in your life. They're not just watching to see how you respond. They're not just watching to see how you're going to take something. But they're listening to what you're going to say. They're listening to how you're going to pray. They're listening to what's going to come out of your mouth. And what better way that when you as a Christian go through persecution and go through hardships and get thrown out and get put down upon by this world that you still have prayer in your mouth and a song in your soul and the prisoners heard them. It speaks to the world. It speaks to the world. And it says that when all of that had happened, and, and by the way, the, the verse starts, it says, and at midnight. Can, can I, that's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. You could preach, Pastor Peter would probably agree with me, you, you could preach on just those three words right there at the beginning of verse 25. And at midnight. What did mid, uh, I, I, no, I'm not going to, no. <laughs> I got to stay away from that because, you know, it's the new year and, and we celebrated a new year at midnight. Come on now. You see, God moves. I'm not going to stay away from it. God moves at midnight. Come on. It was a new day. It was a new year. You know how powerful it is for you? We make these resolutions, right? We make these resolutions at midnight for a new year. You know, it says that they started to pray and praise at midnight. You know what? It was still dark outside, amen? (laughs) It was still dark. (laughs) Listen to me. When God moves at midnight, it could still be dark in your life. Your surroundings may still look the same, but God moved in the midst of it. Have faith that God's moving and working in the background. He moved at midnight. He moved at midnight. I'll stop there. I won't go any farther on that one. But look at what it says. He said there was, it says there was a great earthquake. Come on now. There was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were loose. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the doors were open, he drew out his sword, and he went to kill himself. The prisoners are going to escape. He was going to take his life because, I might as well take my life because when Rome finds out that I I lost my prisoners, they're going to kill me anyway. I might as well just go ahead and take my own life. And when he went to do it, what happens? Scripture says that Paul speaks up and says, no, don't. We're all still here. We didn't go anywhere. You see, the jailer thought that when they were presented with the opportunity of freedom that they would run. Can I tell you? If you've got Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are more free than any worldly institution could ever try to enslave you. You don't need the walls to be outside the walls of a prison or the walls of a jail cell to tell you you're free. You can be in the midst of the jail cell and still be free in Jesus Christ. Amen? And the jailer was a little surprised. And he asked a very simple question. It says he ran to Paul and Silas and he fell down. And in verse 30, it says he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
What must I do to be saved? It was a very simple question. The question almost seems to come out of nowhere, but when you look at the surrounding circumstances, it's a simple question and oftentimes circumstances that bring about that simple question in our lives. Maybe it was the desperation of losing his life. Maybe it was desperation because he thought he was going to lose his job. Maybe he was scared because of the earthquake that had just happened. Maybe he was confused because of the inmate's reaction. Right? They could have left, but they didn't. Maybe it is because the the stage had been set because Paul and Silas had been praising God. And so the Holy Spirit had started softening and working on the jailer's heart. And he thought, who are these guys and who is their God that they would sing praises while they're in jail for him? Whatever it was, something brought the jailer. Something made the jailer realize. Something about Paul and Silas crying out and telling him, no, spare your life. There's no need for you to die. (laughs) There's no need for you to die. But it says that the jailer somehow understood his condition, understood the circumstance, and he cried out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know what I find really interesting about it? How polite the jailer is in his question. It says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, when you're desperate and you think your life is on the line, can I tell you, a lot of times your humility starts to show. He's addressing prisoners. He's addressing what Rome would consider enemies as sirs. He knows they have something that he needs. And he's being polite in how he asks. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You may be saying, well, saved from what? Well, saved from death. Saved from death. He realized he needed to be saved from death. In that moment and in that condition and in that circumstance he had heard all about what he needed to be what do you think Paul and Silas were singing about they weren't singing some random tunes they weren't singing the top 40 of Rome during the time they were singing about the redemption of the people of God they were singing about the gospel and the glory of God they were singing things that they were freestyling on the moment but they were giving praise to God you know what they were probably singing the psalms that you find in your bible the original hymn book of the church they were singing those and he knew his condition he knew that he did not know the savior he knew he needed to be saved and he finally had the quenching of the spirit in order to go to them and ask the question what needs to happen you've got life i don't you've got joy i don't you've got peace and i don't Can I tell you there's some importance there for your singing on a Sunday morning? Some of us, we think that I don't have a good voice, and so I'm not going to sing the songs. Jesus said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Doesn't have to sound good. Can I tell you, when you sing in the congregation, it feeds off of other people. If you sing, more chances are that someone else is going to feel comfortable singing. And when that person sings, the Spirit of God starts moving. You know, listen to me. When they hear you start singing out the words of the hymns and of the praise choruses, the Spirit of God can start moving and softening hearts and speaking to someone that it may just be setting the tone that when that message comes, a response can take place and the question becomes, what must I do to be saved? If you're saved and you know you're supposed to be here and you know you're supposed to be singing the hymns, don't stand there in silence when asked to sing of the praise and the salvation and the goodness of God. It may affect the heart of somebody that's around you that needs to hear it. Listen to me, church. It says, what must I do to be saved. He realized that he needed to be saved. He realized he needed to be saved from his sin. He realized he needed to be saved from death. He realized he needed to be saved from hell. Can I ask you this morning, have you realized those things? You know, it was a simple question, but can I tell you, it was a probing question because praise God, in order for you to be saved, you first have to get to the point where you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Because you've recognized a need to be saved. You know, we live in a culture today where a lot of times we think everybody's saved, that everybody's good, 
right? Everybody's good. Oh, I'm good, Pastor. Jesus and I, we got a thing going, right? He knows me. I know him. He knows my heart. I know. I, I, it, 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 we're good, right? A lot of us are fans of Jesus, right? I always find it interesting. How, how can somebody who is a believer celebrate Palm Sunday? Not celebrate Monday, Thursday, not celebrate Good Friday, and then come Easter Sunday. To me, that's a fan. That's a fan. The high point in the celebration, Jesus is, oh yeah, I'm, I'm good with Jesus, and Jesus raising from the dead, yeah. But folks, listen to me, you're missing the crux of the story. You're missing the fact that he told us that we are to serve that he came to serve us, that he came to wash us, and he he came to cleanse us. You're missing the fact that he went to the cross and he died for our sins, past, present, and future, so that way we could be made white as snow. If we don't get that part, you don't understand the empty tomb. If you don't go by the cross and see the wretchedness of the crucifixion that was for your sin, you're not going to get the joy and elation as to why it didn't hold him down, why he's not there, and why he's defeated death and hell, and he rose again you see it's only the good news when you realize how bad you are and we don't like that today we don't like to be told how wretched and sinful we are the hymn that we all love come on that's known so well amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me that's what you were Some of you may still be a wretch. That's what it is. That's what Scripture tells us. And in order to ask that simple question, what must I do to be saved, you have to realize your need for a Savior. You have to realize your need for a Savior, that you deserve hell, that you deserve to pay for the consequences of your sin, that you deserve to pay for the debt of your sin. Have you realized it? Have you come to that question in your own heart? What must I do to be saved? It's a simple question. But notice, I want you to see this morning what that simple question brought about. The simple question brought about a simple answer. And you know what I love about the gospel? That it's simple. God did not implement a system of salvation that was so complex that you need to degree in order to get it, or that you need a master's degree or a doctor's degree in order to get it. Some of our our most highly educated people in this world are the ones that stumble over the simplicity of the gospel. It's simple. It's a simple question that has a simple answer, and praise God when that simple question is asked, Paul and Silas were there with the simple answer. Look at verse 31. It says, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. (laughs) Praise the Lord. It's a simple response, the first one, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as the King James says it, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me explain that here for a second. Notice Paul and Silas did not say to the jailer in his desperation and in his need for salvation, go to church. That's not what they said, did they? He didn't say, the response wasn't, do good works. The response was not, well, are your parents saved? Because if your parents saved, chances are you're probably good. No. They didn't tell him to be baptized. They didn't tell him to take communion. They didn't tell him to go through the confirmation of the church. They didn't tell him to keep the Ten Commandments. They didn't tell him to follow the golden rule. He didn't tell people to treat people right. He didn't tell him to live a good life. He didn't tell him to say 50 Hail Marys. He didn't tell him to go to confession. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He didn't give them any of those things that the world gives you or that other religions give you. Listen to me, all those things I just listed, none of them will save your soul. None of them will save your soul. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And notice what it says there, church. This is so important. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on. What, what, what's the difference? You see, when you believe on someone, you're trusting yourself with them. You're turning yourself over to them. Look, you can believe in a doctor, right? I can believe in a doctor that they can do a good surgery, right? But I'm believing on the doctor when I actually lay that on that table and let them operate. A difference between believing in and believing on, all right? You can know that Jesus Christ will save you from your sin, right? You can know that Jesus Christ paid the debt and his blood was shed for your sin. And all you got to do is put your faith and trust in him. But it's a whole different thing for you to believe on him when you lay down your life and let him take over. See, there's a lot of people in this world today that believe in Jesus, but they haven't believed on Jesus. They've given him lip service, but that's about it. They know of salvation, but they don't know the Savior. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus. Put your faith and your trust in him and his finished work. But notice it says, believe on Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, salvation, salvation is not a thing, and salvation is not a practice, but salvation is a person, amen? Salvation is a person. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is salvation, nothing else. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father by me. And when he says there is no other way, church, he means there is no other way. Buddha cannot save you. Muhammad cannot save you. Gandhi's teachings will not save you. Nothing in this world will save you. Enlightenment will not save you. Your own thoughts and your own words will not save you. Your own good works will not save you. Acts 4.12 says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given to men by they must be saved other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. It's Jesus what can wash away my sins? Come on, you know this. What can wash away my sins? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Can I tell you this morning, you can believe in God. Listen to me. This is important. You can believe in God and still wind up in hell. There's a lot of people who believe in God. They believe in a God. They believe in their God. The question is, do you believe in Jesus? God sent his son into this world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know what God's act of love to this world was? That he sent his son. So that way you could be lovable to him. You know, I find it really interesting when you, read, when you hear people say how much God loves you. <laughs> no, God's love can be summed up in one thing. One thing, his act of love by sending his son to die on a cross for you and rose from the dead so that you could be saved. The only thing that makes you lovable unto God is if you accept that act of love and you believe on that act of love so then God can love you. But all roads don't lead to God, folks. If so, he wouldn't have sent his son. And I know we looked at this verse a couple of months ago, and it should scare you, it should scare us, it should, make us, it should make us remember the importance of the gospel. But even Jesus said, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few will find it. But while it's a simple answer that has a simple Savior, and has a simple direction, can I tell you, it's got some simple assurance in it as well. I, I, I love the last part of the verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be saved. You, know, you, want, you want to know why I like, I, I like that? It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say you may be saved. It doesn't say you will be saved as long as you continue to do X, Y, and Z. 
It doesn't say, and you will be saved as long as you feel like you're saved. It doesn't say, and you will be saved as long as you tithe and you serve and you do this and you act. No, it says, and you will be saved, period. Come on now. You will be saved, period. Hebrews 7.25 says, therefore he is able to save, listen to me, completely. How, how great is that? Some people try to tell you, well, when you ask Jesus into your heart, that's just the beginning of your salvation. And there's different levels, and you got to get to all the levels. Where you, no, 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 no. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you call upon the name of the Lord and he saves you, you get all of Jesus all at once, all the time, praise his name this morning. He saves you completely, those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Listen to me, I've said it to you before, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. You are signed, sealed, and delivered unto God by the power and the premise, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Nothing can change that. Your actions, your feelings cannot change that. The moment your actions can make you lose your salvation is the moment you state that there is something more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ to save you. There is nothing that is more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. You couldn't do anything to get saved. You can't do anything to lose your salvation. You are safe and secure in Jesus. When that spirit of God gets in you, it's like when you put coffee in the creamer, or creamer in the coffee. Oh, man, shows you how I take my coffee, right? It's when you put that creamer in the coffee. No matter how much you might want to try to take that creamer back out, you ain't going to be able to. That coffee's changed forever. Just like you. When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you call upon his name, Scripture says the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, and there ain't never, ever going to do anything that you could do or any power that may come that will be able to take that spirit out of you until the Lord calls you home. It is a deposit on your salvation. And look at how it changed this man's life. Look at verses 33 through 34. This simple answer has a simple change. It says, and at that hour, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and his family straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Folks, this is a man that went from being trembling and shaking and fearful of his job and of his life to now someone who is serving and has joy and has hope. Can I tell you, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ can do for you. It doesn't matter what your circumstances may be. The jailer's circumstances are a lot different probably than your circumstances, but they still involved, right, unknowns. Life, death, fear, frustration, all those things. And Jesus Christ, when he came into his house and came into his heart and came into his life, changed every single one of them. The surroundings didn't change. The circumstances didn't change. What changed is that Jesus was now living with this man in his heart. This man had given his life to Christ. And check it out. It may be a simple answer, but it's got a profound effect. It changed his life, and listen to me, it changed his family. It says that not only he was saved, but his whole household then was saved. Now, there's some Methodist theologians that will try to tell you that this is symbolism for that, you know, uh, early children were baptized. It, it, it's not. It's not. It doesn't say anything about it. What it does mean is that anybody can accept the Lord Jesus Christ at any age. <laughs> and the man went back and the man had prominence and authority in his house as the man should. And because of that, they listened to him, they respected him, they revered him, and said, I've taken him as my Lord and Savior, here's why, and I think you should too. And his whole family followed him. Listen to me. Husbands, men, grandfathers, you want to have a profound effect on the spiritual well-being of your family. Number one, profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then tell your family about the Lord Jesus Christ. Most times, if the Lord gets you, men, 
That's why the enemy works so much against men in this culture, just so you know. Because if you can get the man out of the way, the rest of the family will crumble. Listen to me. It says, it says that it was the man that then was able to bring salvation to the rest of the family. They followed him. They followed him. Men, you are the leader in your family for a reason. You are to be the spiritual head in your family for a reason. Take it seriously. There will be a profound effect when you make an answer to the simple question with a simple answer. But how about you? Have you been there? You know what I love? You even see the testimony. Before we get to the conclusion, this is something that isn't really talked about. But if you go into the next section of Scripture, you know what's really neat? You see the integrity of Paul and Silas and the love that Paul and Silas has for the, for the, for the jailer that has now a brother in Christ, right? What is the penalty if the prisoners escape? That jailer dies. You know what it says in the next section of Scripture? It says that after the jailer took them to his house, fed them, cleaned them up, met their family, was able to present the gospel to their family. Listen to me. In the next section, they're back in jail. They're back in jail. It says that the jailer comes and tells them that they're planning on just letting them go. And Paul and Silas say, no, we want to talk to the authorities as to why they put us in here. What kind of prisoners do you know that get let out and then willingly go back into their jail cell and wait. No, I don't know of any, except for men who have a heart and a desire for that man who just came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. They just didn't preach the gospel. Listen to me. They lived the gospel. They lived the gospel because they wanted to protect the life and the family of that jailer. They willingly went back so that all were accounted, knowing that the Lord would deliver us. The worship team gets ready to come back up and lead us in a final song today. Verse 32 says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. It's a simple question with a simple answer. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. Look, we're in a new year. We make new resolutions. We make new mindsets. Can I tell you, a new year won't change you. A new year will not change you. The only thing that can change you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you ever want to see change in your life, the very first thing you got to get right is the simple question with the simple answer. Are you saved this morning? Are you saved this morning? Well, pastor, what does it mean to be saved? Well, have you come to a knowledge that you're a sinner? Have you heard the gospel message that Jesus Christ has come to die for your sins, past, present, and future? Have you admit that you are a sinner? The Bible says that we are all like sheep and have gone astray, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Pastor Jeff, I'm not a sinner. Well, that statement alone puts you in that category. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. You have to admit you're a sinner. But praise God, it doesn't stop there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that wonderful to know that you don't have to do anything to fix yourself up in order for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord? Jesus will take you just as you are right here and right now. He'll clean you up later. He wants you to come as a broken, lost, dirty, vile, wretched sinner. That's what he came for. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for those who are lost. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ this morning? Have you said, I'm a sinner and I believe 
that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he came and died on a cross for me and rose from the dead. And last but not least, confess your faith in him. Confess your faith in him. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then he goes on in verse 13 to say for everyone, everyone, did you hear that? Everyone. It doesn't matter, man, woman, child. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what walk of life you come from. It says for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved saved. When you call on him knowing you're a sinner and you need a savior. Is that you this morning? If it is, and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, what a great way to start the new year. I'd ask that you come. I'd ask that you seek me out. If you don't feel comfortable coming during the final song, seek me out after the service. Saying, Pastor Jeff, I am there. Pastor Jeff, I remember a day and a time and a place in which I gave my life to Christ. I remember. But there have been things that have happened in my life, Pastor, since then that I just don't, I just don't feel it. Well, praise God, your salvation is not a feeling, it's a fact. It's not a feeling, it's a fact. You can have assurance today knowing that if you've confessed, your, uh, confessed the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit has dwelled inside of you, And while you may have strayed, you may have backslidden, you may have gotten away, he's there to bring you back again. He's there to pull you close to him again. You have that assurance that you are a child of his now and forever. Paul says in Ephesians, he says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal and the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance unto the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but I don't feel saved. Ask God to ignite that fire inside of you again. Ask God to stir the spirit that is within you. Ask God to remind you time and time again that there is nothing that can pluck you from his hand. Gracious Lord, I just thank you so much for this simple message. Lord, for your simple salvation, for the simple question that brings a simple answer. Lord, for the simplicity.